Okay, so um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my camera that shows my palette. It's not showing up for some reason in the software tonight. So I've just put my standard palette up there as well so you know what my colors are. But you won't be able to see me mix as I do this painting. And on the lower left there is the image that I'm going to use today. And this was a scene I took up at um, Winter Park. So Lucy, you're probably familiar with this scene out by Rendezvous. And really beautiful spot out there. I love to paint. And let me just see here if I'm getting a video feed. Hold on one moment here. There we go. There's my, there's a bit of a lag between when I touch the canvas and when I see it on my screen. So, all right, I'll go ahead and begin. So anyway, I'm going to do a little eight by 10 tonight. And uh, this is a scene up in Winter Park, Colorado. And um, I like it because, you know, when I look at a, a picture here, this has a lot of really vibrant color in it, which I like a lot. Um, I like snow scenes because they, you know, you, uh, you have a chance to, to not have so much green in a landscape. The pine trees are a nice strong green. You've got the distant pine trees there that are, um, you know, they're more blue grayed down and off in the distance. So I think it uh, has everything I need to make a nice little painting here. And um, I'm painting an eight by 10. I'm using an ampersand. Um, primed gesso board. It's a cradled panel. No, this one isn't cradled. It's just a flat panel. And my brushes today, I'm going to use, um, well, I've got a mix of my normal brushes, um, Silver Brush Company, Robert Simmons, and Rosemary primarily today. So with that, I will get going here. I like to start by kind of mixing up my the darks of my pine trees. Helps me get an idea just how dark I want to go. And so I'm going to put some of that in here. I'm just thinking about big shapes. I have done a pre-drawing on here just to speed up the process. Um, the drawing helps me make sure I'm placing everything where I want them to be. And aligning things. Kind of with my drawing here. And I'm keeping the darks of the trees kind of thin right now. So if you guys have any questions as I'm going, just type them in and I will try to keep uh, an eye on the chat. Love to answer any questions that you have. Hope everybody had a nice holiday. Um, Cat, you're you're at the end of the earth right now. I'm a bit jealous, but uh, also aware of some of the challenges that came with for you guys. So hope you get back to the states, and it's all a good experience for you. I'm sure it is. You guys always make the best out of whatever, right? Yeah, I'll describe my pigment choices here. So for my the darks of my trees, I usually make my pine trees with a yellow ochre and a um, uh, ultramarine blue. I like the ochre because the pine trees here in Colorado have a lot of, um, you know, kind of you know, dead grassy feel to them, pine needles that are that are dry and such. And so the yellow ochre kind of starts me out right from that. 
So right now this mixture here is is those two colors, ultramarine blue and yellow ochre. And so I'm, I'm starting with those dark shapes here. And you can see a little of my drawing in the video, I think. But I've really just kind of drawn my big shapes. And um, made some indications where the shapes are going to be, uh, you know, in shadow versus the light. But I'm still designing that on the fly here also. Okay, so that's the dark side of the pines. You know, the pine trees give a really nice um, dark structure. The thing you gotta realize with pine trees that isn't always obvious um, is that even if you look at those pine trees in my reference photo there that are in light, you'd think, oh, they're in light, they're a light shape. But when you squint and look at that photo, they're still pretty dark. Uh, those dark greens and typically any upright trees in the middle or foreground, they're going to be a darker value uh, than the background. So I'm trying to mix up the light side of the trees now and I'm using again yellow, a lot of yellow ochre um, as my yellow. I might actually add a cad yellow medium to that to punch up the yellow side of it a little bit and maybe even a cad orange and I'm mixing it right on my palette next to that dark color I just made to see how um, you know how they relate and so I will come in here and put some of that right next to the shadow in the painting and then assess that and so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to compare the dark side and the light side. Is there enough value contrast and temperature contrast where when you look at it, you think it's light? And, um, but that it's not so light, it will um, not stand out enough from the background. So I need it dark enough to stand out still as a dark value mass against the background. And I think this is pretty good right here. So I'm going to mass that in. You know, the thing I like about this ampersand board, you guys probably know a lot of times I paint on oil primed linen and that's really slick. I can wipe that off. Um, I can wipe down the paint off the surface on that pretty easily and sometimes that's handy but I kind of like the fact that on the ampersand board it absorbs into that gesso a little bit and um, I can scrape it back and get the the wet paint off the surface but it will still leave the image um, that's already kind of sunken into the gesso so I'm kind of liking that right now always Always change and try different things, experiment. It's how we try to, how we grow. All right, just looking at my image, my reference, I mean. And I'm going to, uh, I'll get these trees roughed in here, but not too, I'm not going to worry about them too much. Now, as I move to the right-hand side, I'm going to add a little more red into that because I want, I want, um, you know, the value here in light to have some very, you know, um, changes in the color temperature as well to add a little more interest. And these trees are, uh, well, as you can see in the reference, some of them are in cast shadow. which is kind of a nice effect, but you, it's a challenging one to pull off sometimes because your viewer may not understand why the tree changes 
um, so quickly from light to dark. They might, might not understand it if you haven't given enough context. So we'll see. We'll see if I can pull it off or not. If not, I'll uh, choose all dark, darker shapes really, and, and do that. So we stayed here in Colorado for Christmas. I had a nice time. My kids were all here. Spent time with my family. And we had a really nice time. It got cold here. In fact, on the news today, there was a lot of talk about all the, all the canceled flights and stuff because of... Uh, well, various things, a bunch of people are stranded and yeah, typical holiday woes. Phil, thanks for joining from Madison. And Lucy's asking, so you'd later be putting your sunlight on the lighter green than two. You know, Lucy, what I'm putting in right now is the sunlit green. I may punch it up a little bit, but this is the what I would call the general color of that. You know, the other thing about these winter scenes are the, the dogwoods here in the foreground on the left side. You see all that nice red in there. That's a really beautiful color that we get here here in Colorado at least, maybe in other areas, I'm not sure of. Okay, I'm gonna switch my brush here and I'm trying to keep a different brush for each color um, so that I don't have to make such so many brush changes here. So I'm gonna make a, get another brush and I'm gonna make the color up of those Trees on the mountain slope behind. If I can find the right brush. So those are pine trees back um, on the mountain behind there. But look at how much, um, if you squint and look at that reference photo, they are lighter and they are also bluer. So I'm gonna go in and make myself up a pile of paint and I'm using, um, again, yellow ochre, but less of it, more ultramarine blue. I'm lightening it then with titanium white. And I'm gonna add a little bit of an alizarin crimson to kind of bring that, um, counter the greenish kind of hue that I'm getting when I mix in my yellow ochre because again um, as these trees recede yellow falls out of the, the color spectrum when they go back in space so I'm really just taking this from a green adding this cool red which is my alizarin permanent and I'm getting more of a violet with just a little bit of green in it and I'll show it to you here in just a second so those trees are in shadow, but they're lighter than the trees in shadow I just painted. So I need to get that relationship correct. I'm gonna start right here in the middle. And I think that's very, that's a little too close. I'm gonna go a little bit lighter on that. really hard for me to judge with this light, but it still feels like it's a little bit too dark. So I'll lighten it up a little bit more. Dana, a hike from California. Thanks for listening in again, Dana.
Okay, I think that um, sometimes what I do when I, I'm doing a dark object in the back, like let's say I'm painting a mountain scene that is, um, or a mountain range that's in shadow, and it's in the background, I, I will tend to start a little bit dark with that color, and I can always lighten it later. So um, if these trees that I'm putting in are a little bit too dark right now in the final painting, I can go back over with a little bit lighter version of it and not fully cover it, but just a little bit. And what that typically will do is give a nice little bit of interest um, to the color that I put down um, because, you know, it'll be a dark background and then I've added a little bit of brushwork on top that's a lighter value. So that's kind of a nice thing sometimes. And so these trees back here are, um, if you don't ski, you might not recognize this, but um, basically this is a ski area. And so the trees are cut. Uh, there's, there's ski runs in between them. And that's why you see little patches of snow here with trees around it. They can be a little bit more difficult to paint than, than I think sometimes, though. And let's see. So this feels really clunky right now because I've got a big brush and little shapes. Um, but that's okay. That kind of keeps me from getting uh, too much into the detail here. And then as I move over to the left, I'm just going to change that mixture up a little bit to have still the same value, but I'm going to put a little more just blue in it. And again, that's just to add interest and keep my mixture from being boring. Now this, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to attack the snow on here, honestly, because um, it's going to be delicate to put that snow in there around all these darks later, but we'll figure it out. I just said I was going to do a demo. I didn't commit to it being one that is successful. I got a couple art books for Christmas, which I'll share with you guys. I actually I wasn't prepared to really talk about them now, but uh, one's about composition. And so as I read it, if it's uh, it's an older book, and um, actually I got three three new books. One's about composition. Can't remember the author. Sorry. I'll uh, do some videos on them later. Another one is um, by Dan McCaw on. Uh, basically, proven method for creativity or creating art, that kind of thing, which I think is kind of a hokey title. I probably wouldn't have bought it just because of the title, um, but I've heard other people say it was a great book. So I'll, in the show notes here, put a link to that. I haven't read it, so I can't really vouch for it myself yet. And then the third one is a... Um, book by Gertrude, Str Gertrude Stein about Pablo Picasso. So not really sure what to expect there. Another one I heard good things about though. Okay, so now we've got, uh, got the trees and um, I think I'm going to come in and put a little bit, I've changed my brush again, and I'm going to Paint in the uh, these dogwoods in the foreground here. I need a bigger brush than that. That's a really tiny brush. I don't. I want something bigger. But anyway, I'm going to go with this light little brush. I'm not 
finding the exact right one and I don't want to get up. So the dogwoods are really kind of pretty purpley red. So I'll mix that color up. I'm using Ultra or er, um, uh, alizarin permanent and a little cad orange and titanium white. And we'll see where that gets me here. Um, so I'm going to just kind of scrub this in here. I'm going to need to do more work on that. But again, just kind of massing in my big shapes. So I did a few brush strokes there. Now I'm going to go reload my brush with a, put a little more uh, crimson color on there, the alizarin permanent. As I move over here, I get maybe a little ultramarine blue on there. And I'm just scrubbing this in. Maybe I'll add a little yellow. Because I want these shapes to have a little character to them. And you can see all of that in the reference there for sure. So that'll be more of my placeholder there. I guess the way that looks here is that it's going from an kind of a cool blue over on the left side. To, uh, you know, going into the, the reds and then over to the yellows on the other side there. So that's kind of nice. And I'm not really copying my photo, my reference as much color for color, just trying to put in relationship values here that work. Okay. Let's see. And then... And another color here, or another brush. And I'm going to go for that snow color in shadow. So mostly titanium white. Um, and I'm going to go in with ultramarine blue, just a little bit of that. And I think if you keep this a simple, clean mixture, that's all you got to do. This might be a little too light, though. Yeah, I don't know. That seems like it might work. Again, that might need to come down a little bit darker. And I'm going to make up a pretty good pile of this because... The only way I'm going to be able to lay this clean white mixture, you know, this light mixture in here amid the dark greens of that the trees there, is if I have a fully loaded brush and I just put the mark down. And I don't mess with it again. You got one shot, load up the brush, put the mark down, wipe it off and reload and try again. And assess. So every time I put something down, I kind of have to look again and think, well, is it right? Do I need to adjust? I think that looks pretty good. I have a feeling these ski runs are going to take a little noodling for me to get them to feel correct. But I'll get the start in here. I think the main objective is just get the, get the painting blocked in so you can assess if you need to make changes on the 
Whoop. Changes to any of the values or colors in there. This would be good. Sometimes, I don't know if you'd use Thalo Blue or not. I typically don't. But um, I find that the Thalo Blue can sometimes be a really good color for um, snow in shadow. Looks pretty good, I think. So again, if you guys have questions while I'm painting, just feel free to ask. It looks a little uh, amateurish right now, but that's okay. We'll refine it here in a little bit. So this ampersand board also, it can, um, you know, as I leave paint, it, that my first marks that I painted in there, if I come back, sometimes that paint sets up very quickly. And I can come right over the top, maybe even, and make some marks as it's absorbing the paint in, you know. There's kind of a neat, I don't know what it is in my reference here, but I think it might, it's a lake or something over there that has a, this little band of light blue. It's kind of neat. So I want to keep that. Make sure my head doesn't get in the way, sorry. So this is my second live video and I'm trying to get set up to do these every Tuesday at 7 o'clock, so this same time. Um, and I think I should be able to do that. The last couple of Tuesdays had other plans already, but now that we're past those and I've got this in my calendar, hopefully I can schedule around it. Okay. Let's see. So now, um, you know, I'm going to use some of that same blue in the foreground because I've got snow in shadow since I'm here mixing this up anyway. Bring some of that in. I'm mixing up a little more pile of it though real quick. How's my volume? I need to go Increase the gain on my microphone or not, let me know. Eva from Ohio. Hi Eva, welcome. Thanks for calling in. You're listening in, whatever you do here on YouTube. You can tell I'm real tech savvy, huh? Actually, I feel pretty darn tech savvy now that I've got this studio set up. I'm was humbled by just how, uh, okay, Dana and Phil, you say my microphone's good, thanks, appreciate that. Yeah, I feel pretty uh, tech savvy once I got all this equipment set up here, but then of course, you know, my, for some reason, my uh, little camera on my palette wasn't working tonight, so I have no clue. Five minutes beforehand, it just stopped. So just as soon as I think I'm Mr. Mr. Big Shot Tech, dude, the world puts me in my place. You know, and then in the foreground here, I'm just going to put in some shadow shapes. Um, more as a compositional lead in here. That's all I'm doing. And um, my shadow... 
what I've done here in this bank is I had ultramarine blue and white and I put that in. That was the same color I used for the ski runs back here in the far distance. And then I added a little bit of um, alizarin permanent to that to warm up that blue, I mean, basically making it purple, but a purple or a blue with more red in it is warmer. And so um, I'm adding a few strokes of that into that other blue because that uh, kind of mimics how light bounces around in the, the shadow of a snow bank anyway, and um, can indicate a little bit of warmth or bounce, bounced light there. So that's kind of a nice effect. I really, uh, I really have put a lot of effort into learning to paint snow over the last few years. I think some of my most successful paintings have been snow scenes. And um, they are really great. If, if you're interested in snow scenes and um, learning about that, I would recommend looking at any work by Aldro Hibbard, H-I-B-B-A-R-D. He was an East Coast painter and um, really did just fantastic snow in a very unique way. Might not be for everybody, I don't know but he knew how to do it, that's for sure. Okay, so that, that's my snow in shadow. And I actually probably need a little bit of that over here. Now we've got to, I'm gonna tackle the snow on that back mountain. Okay, Lucy, I'm testing you. What's that mountain's name in the background there? This was taken from Rendezvous in Winter Park, looking south. She'll probably know it. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, get that snow in shadow on the back mountain, but see how much lighter that is. Eva, what's your approach to when and how you approach starting to lay in color? Always go with your darks first um, and get the structure. Your darks are generally thinner in paint application too. So you can scrub those in and get your major shapes in and then uh, thickly apply lights on top of that. That's generally the best approach. Sometimes you might be painting a subject though that... Um, you would have to take a different approach. I'm trying to think of one. So let's say you were painting, um, you know, like yellow flowers on a blue background. So if you started by painting the blue background in the darker, and then you tried to paint in the yellow flowers, you're likely to contaminate your yellow paint with the blue and you end up with a green flower. In that case, you're probably better off to start with the yellow paint in and block in the color, the shapes of the flowers, and then carve the outline of the flowers out with the blue background. Because you don't care if the blue picks up yellow. In fact, that can be kind of nice. So maybe to, a better way to say it is, if you're painting something that you don't want to contaminate one of the colors, you'd want to start with that color so you don't contaminate it. I have a special problem here because I don't want to contaminate that blue snow but I also painted in the trees in this background area so you can do both it can just be a little bit more challenging to have to do that when you've painted the darker color first see if I painted this blue snow in shadow here first and then I went in with the tree color I would I, I would worry that I'd pick up too much of the white from the, the blue snow and my tree color would get too chalky, too light, and I don't want that either. Hopefully that answers it. <laughs> Lucy, you don't have to go ask your husband. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> it's the prominent thing there, though. I did a nice painting one fall from up on the hill of this mountain and um, my gosh there were just so many aspen beautiful aspen trees um, it was a really 
gorgeous scene to paint. I'll be going back up to this place this year in the summertime and doing some more painting. Been invited up there for by some folks to paint that area. Might even do a workshop up there more in the um, uh, winter park area. You know, last year I did, or earlier in this year, in May, a workshop uh, that Kat was in up in Grand Lake, and that was a beautiful spot not too far up the road from this. But if I do a workshop in Winter Park, it will probably be later in the summer. So we're well out of the risk of uh, cold and winter. Although it can be pretty painting that time of year. So I really like the shape of the, uh, the shadow on the mountain back here too. And so I'm designing with that kind of an S curve to support my composition. You can see that. Mountain goes off into shadow there. So Eva says, uh, so the last layers will be the lightest unless they lay on top of a dark area. Then put lights in first. Yeah, only put the lights in first, really, if you don't want to contaminate them. Um, but otherwise, the light paint typically is applied much thicker and can be put on top of the darks and next to the darks, and later in the painting stage or later stages of the painting. Like I've put these dark trees in here now, and since I've been painting, I can tell by the glossiness they've already absorbed quite a bit into the gesso board here so I know I'd be able to lay a thicker layer of light colored pigment on top of that without it mixing without it picking all that up hi Momo paints good to see you again ah you're welcome I'm glad you like them and glad you saw the scheduling think I found a good way to do that. We'll see. Okay. So again, just designing this shape here a little bit. I don't really like my brush strokes so much. They're not finished. Um, when I say don't like my brush strokes, I really just mean, um, you know, I can see them going haphazardly every which way. But again, once I get these kind of in place here and my whole canvas blocked in, I can uh, manipulate that. I am getting a little glare off my recording studio lights here, so I need to knock those down so I can judge the value. So that's a good point here. I'll tell, give you all a tip if you're not aware of this already, especially in darks. When you're painting darks, you want the darks to recede in the final painting. You don't want to draw attention to them. If you do horizontal brush strokes and there's ridges of paint, those are going to pick up the lights, especially if it's in a gallery setting where the lights, normally in rooms, the lights are above. The lights shine down and they reflect off those horizontal ridges of dark paint. And your eye, your viewer's eye, is going to read that as reflected light or, you know, it's going to make that dark area lighter. So uh, anywhere that you really need the, the light uh, or the dark area, rather, to be very dark, you want to go in and, and make sure your, your brush strokes are knocked down and vertical. And that will make those, um, those dark areas kind of just go away off into the distance here. So I'm doing a little of that right now. Oh, picked up some paint there, that's okay.
And I'm just actually, it can be fun. This is just a, uh, a mongoose hair or a fake mongoose hair, uh, soft brush from Rosemary. It's a uh, series 279 from Rosemary. And anyway, the, the hairs are real, uh, real soft. So without any paint on there, I can um, just kind of drag through the paint I have on my canvas and soften some of those edges. I'm not blending, I'm softening. And then as I do that, I'm taking my paper towel and wiping off any paint in between any strokes here. So that can be a nice effect to um, just kind of soften an area. Um, and when you look at something in the distance, you can't see the dis the uh, you can't see as much definition of things, details. So sometimes just softening that is a nice way to put something further in the background here. And I'm picking up a little green, unfortunately, there. I can fix that later. Hey, good to hear, Lucy, that it has a lot of light in it already. Yeah, you know, I realized so, you know, someone taught me, I watch a lot of videos and stuff. I'm always trying to learn and get better. So, um, but somewhere around, I think it was a, a portrait painter. They're pretty keen on this kind of thing. But um, I realized that they were defining form really simply with just um, a light you know, the color of the object in the light, the color in the, of the object in the shadow, and then maybe a transition color. So, you know, if you were trying to paint something quickly and get a representation, you only really need what's in light, the, the object in shadow, and um, a transition color between the two, and you can render a three-dimensional looking object pretty quickly here. And so that's all I have in these things. I've got whatever the color is in light, whatever the color is in shadow. Okay, I'm gonna just assess this for a second. And I think I'm gonna put my sky color in here. And I'm going to, I don't like the clouds in my reference. Those look pretty boring. I don't know if I'll be able to do any better, but we'll give it a shot. So I'm starting with the titanium white. For those of you who joined late, I was saying early on about two or three minutes before I started the broadcast, my camera on my palette just wouldn't show anything. Just, I'm not sure what happened there. So sorry, you can't see my mixtures. I'm trying to describe them as I go then. Um, the blue in the sky is pretty light and it's definitely a greener blue here in Colorado. That's pretty common. So I'm taking cobalt blue, which is a little bit warm or a little bit uh, on the, the greener side than ultramarine. So I'm using that as my blue. I used ultramarine in all my snow shadow mixtures and stuff. Uh, but the cobalt's going to be a better representation. It's not as purple. Um, so it'll be a better representation of the sky. Looks pretty darn similar up there when I put it up there. Let me see if I can add just a little bit of a yellow into there. I'm using a uh, cad yellow light. Maybe it's a cad yellow lemon. I kind of use those interchangeably. And I've got some drawing on here. Actually, it's kind of helping guide where I want those cloud shapes to be. Okay, so Kathy, the, of course, I'll, I can message you later about the brush I'm using if you can't hear me now. Earbuds are charging. But yeah, it's a soft, kind of synthetic um, badger hair, so it's really soft. 
it makes a good a good blending brush if it's dry it doesn't have any other color on it already of course all right mixing up more sky color here i got it a little bit crazy i need to start over here so again sky you know if i had cerulean on my palette right now i would probably use that for the sky and sometimes I do have it. I like cerulean, but it dries too quickly. So when I um, leave it in my palette for plein air painting, it goes, uh, you know, it dries up and then it's not a cheap pigment, e pigment either. So I only put it on my palette in the studio if I'm actually doing a larger piece that I need that particular kind of a greenish blue. That's cerulean. So one thing I don't like about these panels, I don't know if you can see it here, but as I'm putting in the sky, I'm getting a lot of that, um, um, getting my brush strokes, scratchy marks in there, and that just doesn't work for a sky. So a couple things you can do. I'm gonna just see here if using my, my knife to drag some of that down and smooth it gives me an effect I like or not. And um, like I said a while ago, if you, you can even scrape paint off of these boards and it immediately leaves a stained mark there. Um, so I like that. I took most of the paint off, but just with my palette knife. And uh, you can tell that's a really much more green color than the blue here. And again, this is a gesso board. There's no linen or anything on it and it absorbs that paint right away. Arvin, hey, better late than never, buddy. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. We are doing a scene uh, just down the road from Grand Lake in Winter Park that I took this photo maybe three or four years ago and have always wanted to paint it. That's the great thing about doing these little live events is I get to uh, just kind of go through my photos. I take a lot of photos, but I'm not so good about painting from them because I'd rather just paint from life. But um, this makes me, this makes me get, um, go through those photos and find something. And since I've painted these locations on location so often now, really, I've done so many, it's hard to believe that I, I really can, I think in part, the way I paint it really comes from a place of painting it uh, from plein air. And um, I don't, I'm not such a slave to the photo reference. Plus I've gotten better at taking photo reference because you, uh, well, you learn what works. And I have a bunch of photos that don't make good paintings too, so I've, I've learned that the hard way. Okay, now I'm gonna put that shadow, or that cloud in, and it's got kind of a shadowed underside there. Shadowy underbelly. Um, I don't really know what color that is, but it's somewhere between, you know, it's kind of that gray purple. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the color I mixed for these trees here and adding a lot of white to it. And I'm going to just see, I'm gonna put it up against the dark side of the mountain there and see if it's, it's kind of dark. I might go a little lighter. Okay, now what I like to do is, um, so I put that shadow side of the mountain in there and now I can come in with this cloud color and I can bring it right up there with a fully loaded brush and just kind of carve into there and create the outline of that that mountain by painting the negative shape of the, the cloud there. So now I'm getting in there and, and hitting the top of that tree, and that's okay. I can come back and reestablish the tree later. Um, I'm, yeah, I almost forgot what I was painting here. Actually, I'm painting the cloud. 
and yeah, you got to kind of just make up clouds sometimes. I'm going to add a little more blue to that. I find every every stroke or so that I, or I mean every few strokes that I make with the, in the sky, in the clouds, if I'm changing the color up a little bit, I kind of like that end result. Um, if you look back at the painting I did a couple weeks ago in the live demo, that whole sky there was just made out of, um, you know, different color brush strokes. I'd do two or three and I'd adjust the mixture and, and it, it was really kind of an overcast day. The reference photo was so, um, just by putting a variety of brush strokes in there, it added interest and I think was a successful sky. It kind of looks, I'm looking at it on my, uh, on my drying rack here. It's, it kind of looks like you've got some sunshine on the clouds and yeah. So anyway, just mix up your, mix it up. Um, I will probably in these clouds here, come and soften these a little bit here. So I've got the underside shadow and I'm going to push the blue over here a little bit more. As you go across the sky too, you know, you've got the sun on one side and which is generally making the sky a little bit warmer. And then on the other side you have, you know, a, a cooler temperature. And so if you make that gradient change, which I'll push a little bit here because I kind of like this, uh, I can bring up some of the, the red feeling from these dogwoods into the, the clouds here too, maybe. It's a theory. But anyway, if you, um, if you vary things and you have a gradation in color temperature from side to side, it helps move the eye across as well. Okay, we're getting to my favorite part of the clouds here. I've just been working on this lately too in my own work. And that is, once I get these in, I'm gonna come and soften them. I did a series of, of um, moonlit paintings for my Tiny Treasures show. And um, a cat has one of them. And I had a breakthrough painting them where I went back in and uh, I softened the, um, sorry, I'm thinking here. I softened the clouds in the moonlit portion of them. Um, and it just had this magic effect that I wanted, you know, that, that you get with moonlight uh, by softening that a little bit. So that was cool. And I'll, I'll see if I can show you that. Now I'm getting lighter in my color mixtures here. And I'm gonna add a little ochre to them too and warm them up a little bit because as we come across the top of these clouds here, they are uh, warming up. And I'm a little heavy handed with this right now because I'm trying to paint and um, not take all day since you all are kind enough to sit here and watch. But maybe that's good too. It proves to me sometimes that uh, I don't need to needle around on stuff so much. Okay. I'm trying to get the lightest light of those clouds and warm it up a little bit here, but I don't want too much, too much yellow in that mixture. But you can see I'm putting those these lights on really thick to our discussion earlier. And I'm laying them right, it's thick enough paint, I'm laying them right on top.
Okay, so let me soften this. See if this works its magic. I think you can see a lot of the um, brush marks and gosh, it's terrible when I get my head in there. Sorry, keep uh, throwing the focus off, I have a feeling. Um, okay, so I'm taking this dry soft brush and I'm not blending, you know, I don't want to blend, uh, move all these colors together. I just want to soften them together. I mean, of course they're blending a little bit, but I am really lightly uh, touching the brush to the paint here. And sometimes like I didn't quite fill in the area there. I saw a little canvas sticking through so I can put a little more pressure and move some paint to fill in the gaps. That's fine. But then I'm wiping my brush off again each time after just a few a few strokes here. And the clouds are probably a little bit of a back and forth, honestly. It's not something you always get in. I, I tend to get a better um, result, something that more of what I'm after, if I um, go back and forth by, and, and what I mean by that is, so I've put my first layer of paint in here. I've got my dark, my shadow side and my light side, and then I'm blending it here. And then I might come back in and put some sky back in there reestablish some of that with the sky. Um, and then I might come back in with more paint in the clouds, just depends. Sometimes you got a little, um, yeah, if you're a little more, take a little, a, a few more risks, I guess, with the clouds, you can get some really cool effects. It's when I try to needle away on them and really paint them the way I want them to be that I get uh, something I'm not really too pleased with. So this is cool. I'm getting a lot of this wispy cloud feel here. Right now I'm just going really quickly and barely touching that surface. I kind of like that. Yeah, that could work. So um, I'm going to come back in with my sky color here. I need to make up some more of it though. And um, there's a lot of soft edges in the sky. That's too dark. A lot of soft edges in the sky, so sometimes it's nice to just put a few defining hard edges in here. And I'll just look at my photo reference a little bit there. I really don't see any, but you know, if I just come in, a fully thick loaded brush, look at that. I may not like this, so. <laughs> But, you know, don't be afraid to try stuff like that. And then I'll come back in again and soften some of that sky because I don't want those brush strokes really to stand out too much. And now if I drag from the sky into the cloud, I'm bringing that color into the clouds and that's one effect. If I want to bring the cloud out into the sky, like it's a wisp of water vapor, then I can go from that direction. Honestly, this is really difficult for me to see the uh, result because I'm getting a lot of different reflected light from my studio lights here. You know, and then another thing you can do, which I probably shouldn't, might regret this, but just come in with uh, a palette knife too and put some stuff in there. Why not? You can always wipe it out, maybe. And I kind of like that. That gave me some uh, some marks that are unique. In fact, that's kind of cool. Maybe I'll do more of that.
Oops, I haven't been looking at the uh, questions here. Let me catch up. Yeah, so if you'd like this reference photo, I can, let me figure out how to share that. You're welcome to use my photo. I own all the copyright to it, so I know it's safe to share and I don't mind if you paint from it. Um, but yeah, if you ever, you know, if you find a photo reference on Instagram or something, just make sure you get the person's permission and to paint from it. Easy for me to take for granted that I live here and get to go out and paint this stuff. Business expense for me to go drive in the mountains and take photos. Rough, huh? Let's see. Dana, the purple clouds are making the snow on the back mountain look like it has a golden glow. Yeah, isn't that good observation? You know, there's no paint right here yet. And, um, but because the purple is um, the complement to yellow, whenever I put that down, then um, it, it starts to make other things kind of come off with a, a warmer or yellower glow. Great point. Yeah, so if I stop right now and just kind of look at the structure of this thing, the bones of it, um, uh, is it reading correctly? Are the, the colors um, and values the right value? I notice in the video, at least that I'm seeing here, we'll have to see how it comes out on YouTube, uh, it looks a little more saturated than I feel it is here in the studio. I think that's just the camera doing what the cameras do. Um, so I think my values look correct. I like my drawing generally. Um, I'm not sure about the color temperatures in the sky yet, but everything else is looking pretty good. And I'm gonna finger paint a little bit here because I didn't bring that. See, if you put enough color down on your panel, and then if you're short, you can just drag some of that down to fill in other areas. Another little tip. That works really good in when you're painting out on location too. Make sure you put enough paint on there um, because a lot of times, you know, you run out of palette space, you're painting so furiously fast that you run out of palette space and then all of a sudden you need a color you don't have a little bit more of it and you can just maybe even scoop, scoop it up from one area and put it down. Okay, I'm using the same. Right now I have one, two, three, four, five, five different color brushes going just to keep them so I don't have to clean them in between here. Now I'm going into the brush with the, uh, you know, the white, the cloud whites in there and I'm going to Put the snow on the mountain and you're gonna have a hard time seeing this unfortunately in the reference or in my screen I think and I might punch that up a little bit um, I like the colors in here it's definitely a warm yellow so actually I don't even need to punch it up I think this edge here where the shadow falls is kind of important from a design perspective and I, I you know I can mess up some of these shadows and, and smooth them over and stuff the blues that I had there before, that's no big deal. I can go back and forth on these. So I think I'm going to add a little bit of uh, an orange. Uh, actually, I'm going to go with a cad red light. And you'll see this kind of thing happen in the afternoons when the sun gets lower. The, um, the light on the snow will start to be a warmer, you know, kind of red. Oh, there I am getting my head in the shot again, sorry. 
Um, but what I can do with this is, is I can describe how the light, you know, the light is going over this mountain form and as it falls off, it's getting, um, you know, it's getting darker and it's, it's turning into shadow there. And so I can show a little bit of that effect by, um, I've mixed up this kind of a yellowed, or I'm sorry, uh, the white has a little bit of a, a red in it, so it's darker. And I'm putting that right on the line, right on this thing called the bed bug line. And I'll do it along the top of the mountain because I'm going to do a little gray up there too. Because I noticed that as the mountain, the top of the mountain turns, it gets a little cooler and grayer. Some of the rocks are exposed up there, it looks like here, so... I'm going to do that. And there's some sharp edges there that I think I'm kind of losing. So I might, I might have to reestablish some of that. I don't want these to look like little round pillowy mountains. You know, I, I want them to look like they've, uh, you know, they're standing out against that background. Some of that in there. Well, that's pretty dark. A little too dark. Okay, that's coming along pretty good. Go back to my white brush. Okay. Actually, I'm just take take a minute here. I need a little more of my medium. My medium I'm using today is Neo McGilp from Gamblin. It's a gel, a really light gel. It speeds up drying and um, imparts a little bit of gloss on the colors as they dry. I'll generally paint with more medium like at a plein air event so that um, as my paints dry, if somebody buys that painting, um, you know, directly after I've painted it, essentially, when it dries, it's still going to have a gloss to it rather than sinking in and um, becoming um, uh, flat and really matte looking. Hey, Eva, I appreciate that. Don't forget to thumbs up and subscribe. Now, this is great. I really would appreciate it. I'm trying to build this channel um, as a way to teach and to share because time is really limited for all of us. And I just feel like, you know, I've spent a lot of money buying courses and such over the years so I can learn. And I would like to um, give that away as much as possible. I like to teach in person. Some of you have been in those classes and I do workshops, uh, but I just can't do as many as, um, you know, as folks might want and I can reach a broader audience this way anyway. So if you're getting value from this, yes, please let me know with a, a like and a subscribe and tell your friends. This is encouraging, though. I think my first one, I had uh, three or four folks and um, already have probably twice that tonight. All 
All right, now I'm spending a little, a little too much time maybe on this mountain here. I'm gonna back off of that for a minute and we'll get the foreground in. So you can see here I've got the, you know, the snow in light and the sh snow in shadow. I think it's reading really well that that's clearly, those are clearly different planes there. And now I'm gonna come into the foreground and put some of that in here. And I'm going pretty thick on my paint. I'm gonna try to keep my head out of your field of view though. I'll just scrub it in. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, let's let's even try just putting some on with the palette knife. So I load some up on the palette knife. Uh, this isn't going to work because I've got these little screws on my easel here. But, you know, you could apply it on that way too and then get the paint on thickly and then manipulate it with the brush. And I can pick up, see how I'm picking up a little bit of that red in my paint? Uh, my white, and I bring the white up to those dogwoods, and then I, it uh, sullies the, the white with a little bit of the red. But if I know that's going to happen, I can drag a little bit of that in, and it's, it, I'm basically pulled down some red into my white snow, which is the, in effect, it makes it look a bit like reflected light from those dogwoods. I'm not going to get too picky on the white here right now. I'll probably clean that up a little bit off camera when I can sit directly in front of it. Um, but what's really um, important I think in this scene is that like along here in the background there's these little bits of light or little bits of snow that are in the light. And I really like that. Okay, so Lucy's asking, what does snow do as it gets closer to you? Darker and warmer? Yeah, you know, I kind of struggle with this one, Lucy. Honestly, I'm working on another painting right now of a farm scene. Um, you know, ah, gosh, I've studied it. I don't know that there's really one answer to it. If you have a flat plane of snow, um, I tend to notice that, yes, as it gets closer, it might be a little more mauve or um, what's another word for that color? Kind of a, a little bit of a violet to it. Um, and it might be, you know, move to the violet and the blue spectrum as you're looking more down at the field of snow as it's closer to your feet. Where as you look out into the distance then, that angle of refraction is lower. And so you end up, I think, uh, in my observation at least, you end up with a little bit um, a lighter field of snow off in the distance. Lighter and cooler. In the distance and a little more color saturation as you come forward. But you know what? I've found with snow you can do whatever you want to further your composition. So for example this farm scene I'm working on that's in the winter, I'm going darker in the foreground because I want, um, you know, I want the eye to be pulled up into the scene, not to stay down in the, you know, in the lower part of the, um, the actual scene. So I'm making that a little darker. So it just naturally, you'll have a, a crescendo of light as you're looking more toward the middle of the scene is my, my uh, goal. Okay, so I've just added some snow banks in there. Unfortunately, the video is really washing out the whites here. You're not seeing the nuances of color. But they're, you know, it's very pale yellows and, and um, a little bit of red in there.
And, you know, I haven't even been looking at my reference, <laughs> honestly. Um, so, yeah, I find that's usually quite often the case where I will, I will paint um, from a reference, you know, or even just a plein air piece to get it started. And then somewhere along the line, the painting just kind of takes off and it starts speaking to me. And um, you start painting in response to what's developing on your canvas rather than just copying copying a scene. And I'm going to put a little, little bit of this in the background through the dogwoods there so it, you can tell that that bank in the background is, you know, you can see through the dogwoods here. Um, so I kind of like, I'm going to, I'm going over this edge here and it's softening that transition from the shadow into the, uh, into the light right over here. So I've got that nice and soft, but I can just put a chunk of white paint on there too to indicate something else is going on. Like a transition or a, a gentle roll in the shadow. Sharp edges indicate, you know, a, a fast transition. Um, soft transitions indicate um, more of a rounded form that is moving more, the light's moving more slowly over it. Okay, I, I like that, I'm gonna leave it. Now let me come back to those trees here for a minute. I can find that original tree brush. Um, I've still on my palette here, so as I've been mixing, each one of these color families has its own little pile on my on my palette so they're still there I know what the what the color was of the trees in light I need more paint so I'm gonna mix that up a little bit more here I'm using the yellow ochre cad red light a little bit of white because I don't want it to be so saturated and the white kind of knocks back that color a little bit Yeah, that's a little bit. Now, when I put this down to begin with, it was a little bit darker. <clears throat> and now what I have is a little bit lighter, and that's not necessarily bad. That is a, you know, adds a little more value depth to it as well. So, but now I'm going to actually go in and, and try to give some definition to these trees, make them look interesting here and that's thicker paint I'm laying on top and I'm kind of dragging it across the top I'm gonna add a little more red to my mixture as I go to the tree next to it maybe actually a little green So to make green, I also have a sap green on my palette here, and I just dipped into that real quick. Sap green's a nice, warm, transparent green, and um, if I don't want to mix a, a new green out of my blues and yellows, I can just take a mixture that's nearly there already and um, punch it up with a little sap green, so that's exactly what I did there. Okay. And these are kind of chunky, chunky blocked up trees. I'm not gonna, you know, not gonna draw paint every needle on there. I'm just changing the, the colors a little bit. And making the shapes appealing.
Okay. Well, believe it or not, the hardest part isn't me talking. I, I can't seem to shut up, I guess. I got to remember to keep <laughs> talking rather than just go in my own world, but I don't think I've, um, yeah, I don't think I'm struggling for the gift of gab here. Um, choo -choo -choo. So I am struggling right here to see these, uh, that side of the painting because I have some glare. So that might not be looking exactly right, but that's okay. So again, on the, um, I've painted in the light side and I've got some trees here and this one's all in dark. So I'm going to go ahead and add in some of its light. So what I'm trying to impart here is that something, you know, the sun's getting low in the sky basically and the mountain behind somewhere back there is, is blocking the light. and causing some of the tree to be in shadow. But making that transition look right, uh, yeah, it gets a little bit tricky. Well, let's see, how am I doing on time? Pretty good, I'm an hour and a half in, so I'll be able to wrap this up in the next few minutes here. I think this is impossible to do in an hour for me. Okay, so as I get down here into the uh, transition between the light and the shadow, I'm bringing my colors, uh, I'm actually making them a little more violet purple right now. I don't know if that's the best decision or not, but a transition in color. And then I'll go into the, the blue greens the blue violets for the area in shadow. And I'm using a pretty big brush here. I will just keep with it though since I'm on a roll, but at this point, um, I might actually in normal practice Reevaluate my brush choice as I'm kind of cleaning up the edges and stuff here on these trees. I'm refining that. And again, those vertical strokes in the dark will help keep those darks quiet. And you can put some verticals in for for um, trunks and such. But a lot of the darks that I'm going to uh, leave here are just the original darks. Nothing I really need to um, to change about them, so. And if you look at, um, you know, some of the master works, Rembrandt in his shadows, for example, you'll see just original umbers and such that, uh, 
he first laid in in the uh, eye sockets of the eye on the shadow side, for example. And you can just see right into the, the canvas. And they're so luminous because they're thin, they're transparent. Light can get back in there. And, um, you know, they're just gorgeous. Okay, nearly done. So I'm going to take another. I'll just show you a couple other things. I have a brush I cut off because I needed just a short brush for my backpack. So I ended up with this handle that was left over and then I sharpened the end of it. I use it to sign things, but there's also, um, uh, you know, there's some branches and stuff here and these uh, ampersand boards are really allow you to um, scratch in and, and put different things. Um, you know, you can scratch right back through the, the paint, um, you know, in a really nice way. So I'm just, putting in some little twigs and such here. And in, in this case, they're going, it's scratching right back through to the white. I can do a few of these dogwoods and bring them up. You don't want to go crazy with this. It can look kind of repetitive, but you know, you can get really nice, quick, uh, realistic looking effects with that. I hope you can see that. I'm not quite sure, but um, probably good to have a, yeah, a couple of aspen back in here or something. That always adds a little bit of real, realistic effect, I think. There's just random stuff, you know, and that's kind of nice too. So sometimes in the in the woods where the um, where the snow meets trees and stuff, you get kind of a nice smoky little look. So I just blurred that edge at the bottom there. And maybe that's good, maybe it isn't. Just try different stuff. Okay. Well, I'm gonna call it there. I'm not gonna switch cameras. You don't need to see my face, I guess, today. I'll work on that transition later, but, so this was an eight by 10, um, mostly done. I think I'll, I'll, I'll probably reinforce the edge right there and um, add some more shape to that mountain. Uh, I'll look at this side when it's not in glare and see if there's a, um, you know, any adjustments that I want to make there. But a nice simple statement. I like the painting. I like um, the, big, the big masses in there and um, the feeling, the color saturation, all the things that made me want to paint the reference. I feel like I've got here in this little 8x10 tonight. So, let me look here and see if there's anything question-wise. Uh, well, thank you all for um, appreciating it, and uh, it's my pleasure to, to do this. So I'm glad it's helpful. I appreciate the, the nice comments there. It means a lot to me. Um, so this will be on YouTube. I'll have to publish it out here, but... Um, I'll probably clean it up a little bit if there's some time savings I can get. And I'll try to do this every Tuesday night at the same time. So if I'm going to do it, I'll, I'll uh, put that pre-announcement out there as well like I did tonight. And I think that's a wrap. So um, thanks for spending time with me tonight. I wish I could hear your voices and see your, your faces, but I appreciate all the comments. So thanks again. And I wish you a fantastic week and Happy New Year. Let's see. Yeah, I guess it'll be New Year's Eve before the next one of these. So be safe out there and have a great time. All right. Bye, everybody.